All right, you're good to go. Word. That just threw me off so bad. I thought he left. I, Mike, I thought you left for a sec because the mic just went like off. I'm like, did you just leave? All right, cool. No, I'm good. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Okay, cool. What's up and welcome to the EFIS episode 34. It's July 24th, which means we are one week, one week, Zach, from the trading that trade deadline. What are your thoughts as of now? We had some trades uh, this past week that we're going to get to later. But uh, what do you anticipate as we head in, into the deadline? I think there's going to be a lot of like pretty bad starting pitchers on the move just because there's yeah. a ton of teams that need it. And this second wild card is really, it's really introduced a lot of teams that would usually be sellers turning into buyers because they think they can make that second wild card. And you know, with baseball, like once you just get into the tournament, you could win the whole thing as we've seen in the past. Totally. Baseball is definitely the one sport where that's possible. You don't really see that in like NBA. There's not much parity in those that league. Um, maybe NHL, you'll see that. You know, maybe NBA and NFL, I think, are the two sports. You pretty much know what to expect come up come postseason time. Uh, baseball, I still have no idea. It's late July. I have no idea what's going on. Uh, on that note, a lot went down this past week. We have a lot to get to, so we'll start with our favorite stories of the week. Not necessarily the biggest stories, but our personal favorite storylines of the past week. I will start. Uh, mine's very simple. I'm just glad Mike Trout's back. I'm just glad the best player in baseball is back on the field. Um, he belted three home runs this past week. Uh, looks like that thumb is doing just fine. I was a little worried because Trout's the type of guy who is not afraid to dive head first at any point. Um, so I was afraid maybe he'd try getting back into that too quickly and re-injuring himself, but it seems like he's 100%, so I'm very happy to see that. Yeah, I mean, he hit that home run versus the Red Sox yesterday. So it seems right. like he's good, like opposite field, deep center power. So that's good to see. Absolutely. Um, my favorite story is like growing up, obviously, we had Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds. And I think we're almost having a reincarnation of that with Stanton and Judge. Um, since the since the All-Star break, Stanton's been a, a lot hotter than Judge in, in home run terms. So he's really narrowed the gap there. So Judge has 32 home runs. Stanton has 30. Uh, the next yeah. closest is Chris Davis and Moustakas with 28 apiece. Yeah. But I think we could see a pretty good home run uh, chase coming down the stretch, not setting any records or anything. But I think, you know, deep down, these guys want to beat each other, at least w for those home run numbers. Who do you think comes out on top? And do you think either of them top 50? I'm going to say Stan comes out on top. I think Judge has like, actually quietly been struggling a good amount this second half. He's swinging at a lot of bad pitches. Obviously, he hit, I think, two – Yep. Home runs over the weekend versus the Mariners. His power is – he can just hit it out anywhere, no matter where the right. pitch is in any field. So I'm going to go with Stanton, though. Uh, I just feel like he has something to prove. He had those comments last week saying that, like, if we can't beat the Phillies, we might as well just not play the rest of the game. So I think he really, like, invigorated his team, and hopefully um, that leads the Marlins on a little streak. But I'm going to go with Stanton. And I don't think he reaches 50 at this point. They've slowed down uh, a large amount since the beginning of the season where we were, like, are they going to get to 60? But right. no. Not yeah, like, for example, we saw Bellinger. Bellinger hit how, God knows how many home runs. It's like a matter of 30 days. And um, now I think he's only hit three homers in the past month or so. So it's really so unpredictable with these guys, how many – they go on streaks, and then they'll cool down for a bit. And once they cool down, it's like it's really tough to top that 50 home run mark, T tougher than anyone really – um, realizes around like May or June, but once late July comes around, like right now, it's like I'd be pretty surprised to see Stan and Judge uh, top 50 at this point. So those are our favorite stories. Actually, maybe my favorite story is that we have a new producer. Uh, he, he goes by the name of Mike Graziano. Uh, we, we're going to call him Graz or Graz, 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 Mike. Tell Producer Mike, tell us uh, what you want us to call you. It's it's Graz. It's easy. Yes. It's because it's, there's too many kids that were playing sports as a kid named Michael. So you needed something clever to come up with, so you can identify me with all the random kids playing soccer when you're five. <laughs> so we're gonna call him Producer Graz or just Graz for short. Um, but I like the little producer touch that he's gonna give uh, as kind of a third voice at points of the podcast. He's gonna be the guy putting in all the sound effects, all that good stuff, editing, making sure we don't sound like too much of an idiot uh, at the end. So. Uh, Graz, if you want to introduce yourself, give a little background, go right ahead. Yeah, um, you know, I grew up at just outside of New York City, and I consider myself on this podcast, tell me if this is a dated reference, but as the 2009 A.J. Burnett to your C.C. Sabathia and Teixeira for your Yankees Hall, 
if you know what I'm I talking about. Um, still leads. I think he had 11 walks and a no hitter once. Guy's a stud. <laughs> so many tattoos. I'm all in on AJ Burnett. But um, yeah, I see the so I'm, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> As uh, you know, I get fed up sometimes too. But you know, I'm just trying to make you guys sound a little better. You know, make something. Uh, you know, maybe not talk about the Red Sox. They're not that good of a team. Um, <laughs> they have one player that's kind of okay in Chris Sale. Handler Ramirez is the worst. So I don't know. We'll see I what do. happens. And yeah, uh, so if anyone uh, couldn't tell, if anyone couldn't tell, Graz is a Yankee fan. So I we'll throw that. He's got a, a giant Giants helmet, uh, fat head in the background. Yeah. So. I don't know if you're plugging Fathead, but that'd be a great advertisement. Big Fathead guy. Yeah. Like, oh, I used to be great for any man cave. Yeah. I used to have like four Fatheads. I think I had one of Kevin Euclid. Um, I don't know where that thing went, but I'm, I mean, it's kind of out of outdate, outdated now. So I'm glad that thing's w- gone. Was it, was it before he had the stupid stance or after? Cause he did used to hit normal. Oh, after for sure. I remember the stupid oh, okay, stance. Good. Good. My wall. All right. Graz, that, so that's, I mean, you're going to have, you're going to be a little bit quieter for this one, but we look to have you as a third voice a lot more in the future. Um, we, we have some, some stuff going on in, in uh, later in the podcast, so we're going to have you butt in on that conversation. If you have any hot takes, feel free to chime in. Um, but till then, uh, focus on making us sound better. You guys are doing a pretty <laughs> good job already. I'm, I'm damn proud of you guys. And I'm pretty fun myself. I make some witty comments. I'm, yeah, I'm, awesome. I'm, it'll be a good time. That's all we can ask for. <laughs> From a Yankee fan, especially, we don't expect, we don't expect much. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of fake ones out there. I don't blame you. <laughs> All right, so that was producer Garaz. Had to introduce him. He actually produced last week's episode. Fun little fact there, but we're just officially uh, introducing him on this one. And guess what? I'm about to reintroduce another special guest for the podcast. Doctor Tom is making a comeback. Hopefully, hopefully he answers our call. Dr. Tom, we want to know what he thinks about the Carlos Correa injury, about the Clayton Kershaw injury, two huge injuries uh, that went down in baseball this past week. It's always bittersweet when we have to call Dr. Tom up because that means really bad injuries happen to really bad, really good players uh, over the course of the week. So on that note, let's call Dr. Tom, see if he has anything for us today. Hello. Dr. Tom, that was the fastest pickup of a phone call I think I've ever heard. I am so glad that you picked up. How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. I'm walking the streets of Cooperstown right now. Cooperstown? Are you gonna yeah. are you gonna go in, check out check it out at all or? I mean, this is where my new job orientation is. Oh wow. Wow. Yeah, so I know, right? That's that's pretty pretty interesting stuff. I'm, congratulations. Um Well thank you. So on that note. We have a couple players here that might be might be going to Cooperstown uh, at the end of their careers. However, they're very injured right now. It sucks. There's two stars that are hurt right now. We got first Carlos Correa, uh, torn ligament in his thumb. He's out six to eight weeks. I'm gonna throw you right into the fire here, Tom. As the as the official doctor of the EFIS, what would you do about this injury? How does the rehab process go? Uh, all that good stuff. All right, well, thumbs in baseball, obviously fingers in general in baseball, are very, very important. Um, thumbs themselves are very nagging injuries. Um, they take a while and a lot of rest because you're using your thumbs pretty much in anything you do. That's a now, fact. Now, if it... That's a fact. Yes. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, the best course of action for him in the first couple of weeks are splinting it. And having him rest. Okay. And then you have to start working the small muscles inside the hand that allow the thumb those movements right back. That takes a little process. Because if he's hitting in the cage and he hits the ball off the end of the bat, it causes that thumb to get hurt again. And he gets that back a couple of days. Yeah, we saw Mike thing. Trout. Mike Trout bounced back from a similar injury uh, this past week, actually. I think he was out a similar timetable, six to eight weeks. I think was the case for him as well. Um, and he bounced back. He's, he's diving into second base. I mean, he's, he's not afraid to dive head first anymore. So it's clear to see he's a hundred percent, but is this the type of injury that say Correa comes back and does the same thing? He might not be as fortunate or is six to eight weeks, usually a really good timetable to repair that ligament. 100%. Yeah. 
I'd say it's pretty decent timetable because in um, players such as those high-profile ones, they're going to be more cautious because they are the face of the franchise. Right. So they're going to do everything they can to keep them on lockdown until they feel that the person is comfortable 100% to come back and play and not be hesitated when he does so. Gotcha. And then we have a different type of injury here. We got Clayton Kershaw, uh, very similar as last year. Uh, lower back tightness he exited the game with. I think he's on the DL out, I think, four to six weeks. Um, I think it's just a nagging back injury. I really don't know what the deal is there. I don't know the exact diagnosis, but anytime a pitcher's dealing with a back injury, uh, I can't imagine that it's too good, especially when it's a guy like Clayton Kershaw. I think he got an epi- what's it called? An epidural? Yeah. So yeah, how? That's I, just it's just a pain reliever. Okay. Is what it is pretty much. Gotcha. So um, yeah. A lot go of right the times with pitchers, a lot of times pitchers, especially the guys who are doing a lot of rotation and their windups, stuff like that, they get a lot of back issues because the spine itself um, only has a certain amount of cartilage between each vertebrae. Um, now, aggravating stuff like that can cause them like the back tightness and spasms. Um, especially with major league pitchers who are putting so much torque right. and force on their bodies. How worried do you think uh, Astros fans should be about Correa's injury, and how worried do you think Dodger fans should be about Kershaw right now? Um, Correa's injury is more of a nuisance, I think, because he's going to be out for that amount of time. Okay. I think once he comes back and he feels 100%, there really shouldn't be too much to worry about. Okay. Um, Kershaw... I mean, if it's something he's had in the past and he's still experiencing, uh, this might be something that he might deal with every uh, every now and again throughout the rest of his career. Yeah, I mean, we saw it last year. Where it seems like it's the same thing this year, roughly around the same time. he did. I think it was a month. I think it was end of June last year. Now it's July. So if the Dodger fans have to deal with this every year, uh, that would be really unfortunate. I think he has a 204 ERA right now, so never a good thing for the first place Dodgers to see that happen. Um, Tom, those are the two injuries we wanted to talk about. I just have one last thing to ask you before you hang up here. What are your thoughts on the Todd Frazier trade? Todd Frazier? I think it helps. Okay. To be honest, um, I don't think it was a bad move. Uh, he's obviously coming in and doing all right. He's been in the center of a few of the rallies and stuff like that. I think bringing in somebody who's just a fresh person into the clubhouse sometimes can help even if they're playing every day or not. Um, and obviously, he's pretty much been an everyday player since he's been coming to the league. And you, into a, and you got a couple bullpen arms there, too. What are your thoughts on that and, and the prospects that the Yankees gave up in that trade? Um, I think the arms are well needed. If we're going to contend this year, um, right. our bullpen, who was thought to be one of the better ones, are all the Chapman shaky a little bit. So, yeah. I mean... More people to throw into the mist to see if they can come in and be a big impact player, which isn't always a bad thing. Gotcha. Obviously, they can go bad, but you don't know until you try. And then, given our prospects, I don't think is too much of an issue. Obviously, we've gotten a lot of prospects in our last few years as an organization through right. trades and stuff. So, giving three or so away isn't going to do as much. Because we still have, we still have a few that are coming up and are now just in the league and doing pretty well. So I mean, we have a fairly young roster as well. So if you could grade that trade, uh, what would you give it? As of now, I would say probably a B. Okay. I mean, you never really, you don't ever really know until like then a year and see if we keep him or not. Because I know he's coming up to the end of his contract. Right. Um, but I feel like he's the type of player who will fall in love with playing in New York because he's around from around that area. All right. So well, might. yeah, I, I honestly, I mean, we're going to grade it later. Uh, I think it was a great trade for both sides. Um, I'll give my exact take later on the podcast, but I think it was a great deal for both sides. As a Yankee fan, I think you should be pretty excited with the trade. Uh, on that note, Tom, thank you for joining the show again. Um, hopefully we don't have to have you on again for a, a little while because we don't want any really good players going down with injuries, but it is a pleasure, Tom, 
as always. Um, so Don't take it easy. Coming on. Yep. Uh, take it easy. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Enjoy Cooperstown, Dr. Tom. <laughs> All right. So that was Dr. Tom. Always a pleasure to have the one and only doctor for the Eat This podcast uh, on. I mean, like I said, we don't want to see guys like Kershaw in Korea go down, but just the fact that Tom's presence was felt, uh, that's it makes all the difference in the world. So on that note, Zach, what do you think about these injuries? Do you think Astro fans – I asked Tom this question. Do you think Astros fans should be worried? Do you think Dodgers fans should be worried? They're two, the two best teams in Major League Baseball right now, but do you think this hinders their chances come playoff time? Uh, not really. I think the Astros have – uh, you know, a be better depth of that position. They can plug in Marwin Gonzalez to play some short. Bregman can play some short. So I think they can fill the hole a little better than the Dodgers can, who, you know, the second best starter, you know, it's, it's really up in the air. You know, is it uh, Alex Wood who's been unreal? You know, is it right. someone else? So I, I'm more worried about Kershaw's injury just because I've had back issues myself and those things like you think they're gone and they just come back. So I would be more worried about Kershaw if this is like a nagging, reoccurring injury. I think Correa is just a simple thumb injury, and, he, and he'll be back based on the timetable too. I agree. I, I deal with lower back pain myself, and I just don't understand. I mean, I know they, had, they have the trainers. They have all the equipment, the rehab like regimens to come back from these injuries. But as someone who experiences lower back pain on a daily basis, I don't understand how Kershaw can go out there and just pitch like nothing ever happened. It's like it's one of those things that just nags you every single day. Um, so hopefully they both come back at 100% because as a baseball fan, it's always great to see them compete. Um, another guy is for... – Oh, yeah, absolutely, Graz. You're more than welcome to. No, this is just completely off base, but how do you both have lower back pain? You guys are young people. Uh, like... Runs in the family, genetics. Uh, working out at the gym and never – I re-aggravate it every single day. Um, see, this, so... is, this is why I don't work out at the gym. Just putting it out there. Like you're, I, you're getting hurt out there. I'm very comfortable here. Like, you know, sitting in my bed and, you know, things like this. <laughs> so I don't go to the gym because I don't need back pain. I'm only 22. I, I envy the producer Graz life. It's just, I don't know. I don't know why I do it. I don't know why I put myself through it. Um, it's just, like I said, it's genetic. I have the worst lower back it around. I, it sucks. I, I, mine's actually upper back pain and it was from like a basketball injury. So I, I go to the chiropractor like once a week to, to help. Brutal. Out. Yeah, it's bad news. It's not fun. <laughs> not fun. Uh, but what is fun is watching Nolan Arenado play baseball. Unfortunately, baseball fans couldn't watch this uh, because the game in which he hit three home runs went five for six. It wasn't even televised. Now, I didn't really read into too much why it wasn't televised. If you or Producer Gross has any info on why it wasn't televised, please let me know because I have no clue. But – the guy, Nolan Arenado was the NL player of the week this past week. And the fact that that game's not televised and just Colorado is still that far off the radar where no, where no one gives a fuck that he hit three home runs and went five for six, it, it blows my mind. I really don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, Colorado just gets no respect. And that's kind of why we've tried to highlight them on this show because they are playing good baseball. They play exciting brand of baseball. So. The fact that a three home run game just goes under the radar like that is amazing, especially with a player like Arenado who's like up there for NL MVP candidates. Right. It it's just shows the double standard. Like the, a guy I raved or raved about last week who doesn't really get that much attention, uh, Anthony Rendon, he actually, I, I believe he had a three home run game way earlier this year and it got all the headlines. So that just, I mean, that Anthony Rendon is a guy who doesn't get a lot of respect this is just a whole nother level of no respect with Nolan Arenado. The fact that he's in Colorado means he's never really going to get the national headlines. So it's unfortunate. Um, I, I really don't know anything else to say. Graz, do you have any input on that? It looks like based on some brief research, thanks to the internet that the sports net only bought a 150 game package. And that was one of the 12 games that gets left out by okay. chance. That sucks. That's just shitty luck, I guess, on that That's part. That's unfortunate. But, uh, to a point, it's like, just buy all the games. If you're going to buy 150, why aren't you buying 162? I mean, if you're going to go that far, just go all the way. I don't really know how all that works, but... Uh, that's what happens when you don't buy all the games, then you're going to miss out on the one game and Arenado hits three fucking home runs. Great, great job, Graz, looking that up really quickly. That was that's, 
that his first real day on the job as producer and he digs up that info in two seconds. Props props to producer Garaz. Great, great start. Told you, AJ Burnett. ERA under four for that year. It's big. Exactly what That's you're expecting. Huge. It's a huge contributor. It's it goes under the radar, but it's a huge help. Um, this guy, this this is the worst segue of all time. But the next guy we're talking about just sucks ass. Pablo <laughs> Sandoval. <laughs> literally, Pablo. Pablo literally, Pablo <laughs> Sandoval. Uh, as Red Sox fans, me and you, we've had to deal with this guy for the past couple of years now, and it's just it's been an absolute train wreck from start to finish. He signed with the Giants. He's, I think he signed a minor league deal with the Giants, his first team, uh, the te- for team that he started his career with, uh, won a, World Se- a couple World Series with. Um, and, yeah, he's back with them after trashing them basically when he left. He said the only players or people in the organization that he'd mix- miss were Hunter Pence and uh, I, believe, I believe he said Bruce Bochy. Uh, those were the only two. And then he's back. So hypocritical Pablo Sandoval, who only cares about himself, uh, is back in San Francisco. Good riddance. Um, now he's saying he wishes he never left San Francisco. So this guy just he sucks as a player. It seems like he sucks as a person. Uh, he I don't even know if I want to give him that much time on this podcast. Exactly. He bad mouths the Giants when he leaves, and he bad mouths the Red Sox when he leaves, and he didn't even produce. So I don't even I don't even get it. And I don't, I hope the Giants don't even give him a shot. I mean they're they're like probably the worst team in baseball. So you know, good luck. You know making that team and doing anything right. consequential. I mean, he had such a good track record. He's got to go down as one of the worst free agent signings in Red Sox history. You know, you, you used to think Carl Crawford, maybe David Price would be the worst, but Sandoval yeah. has got to be that. Rusne Castillo as well. Never thought anything would ever top those signings, but Pablo Sandoval definitely has. And just the fact that we're – that this shitty of a player is getting this much national attention just makes me mad. He's just not good, but he's such a big name because of like one year in the playoffs where he was a pretty, pretty solid player. It just blows my mind. I, I can't stand this guy. I hope this fat ass just like, like you said, is in single a baseball for the giants for the rest of his life. Uh, then we got a couple studs. We talked about a dud. Now we're talking about a couple potential studs. Anyway, Yon Moncada and Rafael Devers both getting the call-ups for their respective teams this week, the White Sox and the Red Sox. Um, Devers hasn't made his Major League debut yet. That comes uh, – unless he has an appearance today. He was called up Sunday. Unless he makes an appearance today, which is Monday, um, he won't get an appearance until Tuesday because he's starting Tuesday. I just don't know if he's going to pinch hit or something tonight. So we'll see about that. I'm very intrigued uh, what we're going to see from Devers. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, he's got some pop, which is what this Red Sox teams need. They need doubles, guys. They need home runs, guys. Obviously, his defense is, like, something the left to be desired. I get, I think he has, like, five or six errors in, like, nine games with the Paw Sox. But, uh, you know, Farrell likes his defense. Obviously, he's playing Marrero down there, who's got a bad back, uh, a bad bat, but he has, you know, great defense. So, we'll see how it works out. I'm excited. Anytime a player, like... Uh, a young prospect comes up with this much promise. You got to be excited. And, and it shows me the Red Sox are kind of desperate and they don't want to make a trade for a third, third baseman. Cause I, I know their previous comments were saying, you know, this guy's not ready to come up right now. Like there's no rush, but now it seems like there's a rush. So I, it sounds like he's going to only start versus right-handed pitchers too. So Paxton's pitching tonight. So he won't be in the lineup probably. Right. Yeah, unless like a right-handed reliever comes in late, it's a close game and they need a pinch hitter or something like that. I don't think Devers will play uh, tonight. But Tuesday, all eyes are going to be on Devers. I mean, he could be the future for the next decade or so uh, for this Red Sox team over at third base. So I'll be I'll be tuning into that for sure. Um, as for Moncada, I'm not really sure. I haven't checked his numbers from this past week. He was brought up a few days ago right after the Frazier trade, um, which we'll get to. But Moncada... I I expect really big things from Mankata. I think he's set up to succeed in that White Sox organization, which is just has is it's just loaded with prospects at this point. After that Yankees trade and after that Cubs trade with Quintana, th- this team is loaded with prospects, and Mankata is probably going to be be the leader of one of the more successful young teams uh, in a few years. Yeah, I worry about his plate discipline. I, I'm looking at his stats here. He's hitting 77. So far, like zero not great. seven. That's not great. I mean, I think I could maybe have a better batting average than that. And he had a two eleven when he came up with the Red Sox with a brief stint 
last year. So he's definitely got all the tools. I mean, look at him. He's like a Greek god the way that guy's built. But, you know, you do have to hit the ball. Right. <laughs> he hasn't proven he can do that at the major league level. So it, this trade for Chris Sale, it's looking better and better on the Red Sox. I mean, Kopech's definitely unreal. But until they prove it in the major leagues, it really doesn't matter. Very true. I mean, we saw this with, like, again, another Red Sox guy, Ruzne Castillo. He might rake in AAA every now and then, but once the second that guy gets brought up to the major leagues, it was like he's never swung a baseball bat before. So, um, Moncada, again, plate discipline's a problem, but plate discipline's a problem for virtually every single guy who makes that jump from the AAA level to the major leagues. Because I think you're just so anxious as a hitter. You want to get, like, you want your average to shoot up to 500 and be, like, the next big thing. Um, but Mankata's struggling right now. Whether he'll continue to struggle, that's something to keep an eye on. But I, I don't think Mankata's going to have any issues. I think he's going to be just fine. Yeah, I'm still a little worried, but at least we yeah, have I mean, on it, So There's reason to worry, for sure. Um, but if you're a White Sox fan, I think you can be nothing but encouraged right now with all the prospects you got, uh, especially that Jimenez guy who they got back in that Quintana trade because he is – he is a special player. He was the Cubs' number one prospect, uh, an outfielder, and he's raking in AAA. Again, we'll see how he does in the majors, but good sign so far there. Um, one more Red Sox story, and then we're going to move on to some other talk here. Dennis Eckersley, this is probably the biggest story in baseball right now. For Dennis sure. Eckersley, a Hall of Famer. He's a broadcaster for Nesson. Um, he had, well, I'm not going to say strong words. He said yuck about Eduardo Rodriguez's stat line in a rehab stint in AAA. And apparently David Price went off on him uh, on one of the team flights. We heard about like rumors of bad blood between the two like a couple weeks ago, but we never heard the full story. The full story broke this past week, and it's not sounding good for David Price and the rest of the Red Sox uh, team. So I guess what happened is David Price stood up and basically – like right in front of Dennis Eckersley said, there he goes, the best pitcher of all time. This game comes easy for him, like sarcastically um, kind of mocking him a little bit. And, you know, I kind of, by the sound of it, could just kind of sat there and took it. And then anytime Eckersley wanted to say something back, David Price would just say, get the fuck out of here. Um, and I, I think that happened again later in the flight when Dennis Eckersley walked near the team. He did it again. The rest of the Red Sox, by the sound of it, this is um, a Dan Shaughnessy article. So this is what he, this is his account of the incident. So I'm just kind of saying what he said. And it sounds like David Price just kept saying, get the fuck out of here to Dennis Eckersley. And it was like the Red Sox applauded him and like laughed and thought it was hilarious. So not the best look for David Price, who already is known as a uh, head case in this Red Sox organization. Not a look good for, not a good look for the red, rest of this Red Sox team. They're becoming more and more, easy to hate by the way like i hope this doesn't change eckersley's broadcasting style because i love watching games that he's on because he's brutally honest he, yep. he he comes at it from a fan's perspective he's not wiping the ass of the players like steve lyons or you know remy sometimes will criticize him but eckersley does it like, like he just says it. he'll say yuck when like it's a bad pitch or i i just love that because the fans are thinking that and this yep. is isn't this incident it, I've like gone over the edge with David Price. I think that guy is a cancer, like in that clubhouse. I know Pedroia should be probably the leader in there, and the fact that he hasn't stood up and sort of got David Price straight and saying, like, you know, like these young guys, you're setting an example for them. You don't treat a Hall of Fame pitcher like Eckersley like that. I mean, you can treat me like that on Twitter if I say something because exactly. I exactly. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Eckersley has the track record, and you have to respect that. Um, and it the, the Shaughnessy piece did remind me of the Jackie Bradley thing, which I think that thing is worse than the price thing. Really? Asking for a photo with Eckersley, knowing you're going to tweet out this, like, passive-aggressive thing True. at him is, like, one of the most contri – like, worry about playing baseball, True. dude. Honestly. Like, stop being a baby about the media. That the, What you said is perfect, like, to sum this situation up. This Red Sox team is pretty hateable. Right. Like, a lot of members on this team I hate. They just don't have that it factor of, like, prior – lovable Red Sox teams. They don't have the Kevin Millars. They don't have the Schillings. They don't have the Pedros, the Mike Lowell's. They don't have guys that have that it factor that know how to win and just can like put on blinders. Everyone on this team cannot take any criticism from the Boston media. And I mean, it doesn't bode well for success in, in this season and in the playoffs, especially. You know what? I hate to say it. 
You're exactly right. This team has no character guys except maybe Pedroia, but we've even seen leadership issues from him this season. Um, with that whole Machado thing and saying it wasn't him. I mean, it wasn't me. It was them. Uh, but I think it was who hit Machado. I forget who it was. Ah, uh, Barnes, not Barnes. He, he was pointing. He was like, oh, it's not me. That's them doing it. Uh, to Machado, he was saying that. So that put Pedroia's leadership in question a little bit. And don't get me wrong. I am a the biggest Pedroia guy on the planet. I love Pedroia to death. But when the Red Sox are being considered as a hateable team because multiple players don't know how to keep their mouths shut and just play the game, there's a leadership issue in that clubhouse. And that has a lot to do with the absence of David Ortiz. Um, that's what it all comes down to. David Ortiz was the guy who kept everybody in check. I don't know if Pedroia is capable of that. I think Pedroia might be one of the guys who wants to be liked by the rest of his teammates so he won't mouth off to them. Um, that's at least how it appears from an outside perspective. You're not going to win without guys like Ortiz. You're not going to win without guy, like all the guys that you types of guys that you mentioned on the 2004 team. You're not going to win without guys like David Ross who was on the Cubs, a major reason why the Cubs won last season and probably a major reason why they're struggling this season. They've picked it up lately, but they've struggled for a lot of the season. I don't think that's a coincidence. You need character guys in the clubhouse. Yes, you need as many talented guys as you can, but you need team chemistry guys, Johnny Gomes, guys like that who are going to say, look, shut up. Let's play this game. Let's win today. That's what you need. I don't think the Red Sox have that. I have a question for you guys. You guys are both Red Sox fans. Yep. Sorry to jump in here. All right, producer Graz, let's hear it. Here, here we go. Here's a question. I have been thinking that John Farrell is a bottom five manager in baseball for a while now. Okay. Do you put any of this on him because they're just kind of running wild? I don't think he has control of his players at all. I think he's a solid in-game manager when it comes down to it. I think he's better than most managers in baseball. He makes mistakes like every other manager in the league. The guy doesn't know. I don't think he interacts with his players much. I don't know. I don't think he has great communication with players on the team, especially rookies, especially up and comers. I think he might have good communication with guys like Pedroia and that, but I don't think, I think most of the guys on that team, and it's been said, Travis Shaw said on, uh, over on the section 10 podcast, that's Jared Carabas's podcast. Travis Shaw made an appearance on that podcast and said that there was a miscommunication between um, him and Farrell, and that was a major reason why Travis Shaw was traded to the Milwaukee Brewers, and now we're seeing what Shaw's capable of is one of the better third basemen in the National League. So, yeah, I, I don't think Farrell is really the – like, I don't think you can win with Farrell anymore. I really – I think 2013, you just had the right clubhouse guys um, who that, – at that year, Farrell didn't have to interact with his players as much because they already had all the veterans, all the character guys in the clubhouse – now they don't have it, and now they're just not the same. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I, I'm not a John Farrell fan. Like, I think he lost his team, like you were saying, Justin. And to this point, I think there's two groups of players in this Red Sox clubhouse. I think you have Pedroia and maybe a couple other guys, the older guys, and then you have a guy like Price, Matt Barnes, maybe, you know, Bradley, these younger guys who, who feel entitled. And whenever you start feeling like that, that's not a good recipe for this right. team. Um, you know, the team look to their manager for leadership. And if he can't communicate with them, um, they're kind of just going to go off on their own. It's going to turn into a, you know, a circus. A, everyone. Yeah. Like a circus. No one has control. No one is sort of the face of the franchise. It, it's, it's a bad situation. This story only, only came out. It looks terrible for the Red Sox players for sure. Absolutely terrible. I, 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 again, the Red Sox are my favorite team in all of sports and they're not, Fun to watch. This is one of the least fun teams to watch uh, in Red Sox history, and they're a first place team. That's a problem. Uh, that actually leads me to like we're talking about how they might struggle come playoff time because they don't have leaders, whatever. So, <laughs> I heard this question on Boston Sports Radio, uh, ninety eight point five, the Sports Hub. It was a very funny question. Uh, we all know OJ got out on parole. Uh, he's set to come out, get out in October. Uh, what happens first? OJ gets out. We don't know when in October he's going to get out, but what happens first, do you think? OJ gets out of prison on parole, or the Red Sox get ousted from the playoffs? Red Sox get ousted. Like I know they have Chris Sale, um, which should make them a favorite in any any series if he, if he can pitch twice, but I, I literally have no belief in this team. Like I think they could get balanced early. They just don't – 
they're just a team that they're they're almost like a regular season team. Like they can win the division. Well, whoop de doo. Like if you can't do it in the playoffs, who cares? All that 162 games, like day in and day out, it doesn't really matter if you can't do it in October. So I right. would say OJ gets out. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're set for a similar uh, postseason as last year. I think they're going to get in there and not know what's about to hit them. Uh, we all thought they were so talented. There's no way they were going to lose to the Indians last year. I think we're headed towards a similar postseason. I don't think they've learned their lesson. I don't think they, ha- they have the fiery guys, the fiery competitors that they need to beat guy- beat teams like the Indians in the playoffs. So, yeah, I'm going to go with OJ. <laughs> OJ gets out first. Graz, I'm interested what you think about this. All I'm going to say about that is don't get stuck in that wild card game. You got to stay focused and win the division. That's why I'm so obsessed with the Yankees winning the division. Because even though you have Chris Sale, I've seen Chris Sale pitch excellently and lose two games just to the Yankees. You yeah. don't want to get stuck in that. So, oh, yeah, OJ by a landslide. And also, because <laughs> I'm telling you, you guys aren't buying in. The Cleveland Indians are going back to the World Series. Stay tuned. I love me some Cleveland Indians. Ever since Trevor Bauer hat tipped, <laughs> After four and two thirds, giving up three runs, I've been in on Trevor Bauer on the Indians. I hate Trevor Bauer so much, but that's a that's a hell of a move by that guy. Um, so we're gonna move on to power rankings here. I'm glad you brought up the Indians because I'm sure we're gonna have some some interesting takes on the Indians as we move on to power rankings. We just have our top four teams in both the American League and the National League. Let's start with the American League. Zach, what are your top four teams as of right now, July 24th, in the American League? I have the Astros one. Um, Obviously. They're a juggernaut right now. Sort of worried about their their uh, starting pitching, but I think once they get Keuchel back, he'll be that start of the rotation guy. Uh, I have Cleveland, too. Like Graz was saying, I'm in on the Indians. I think they got Salazar back, who pitched an unbelievable game. They have Carrasco. They have Kluber. Uh, they have Trevor Bauer. Uh, sort of a, a second thought. Don't forget but, uh, about Trevor Bauer. <laughs> yeah, their 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 offense is unreal. Back of the bullpen. I mean, you go Shaw, Allen, Miller. Doesn't get much better than that. Three. I'm gonna go Red Sox. Uh, the AL is kind of a a, a trap uh, a, a garbage right now. So I don't even, like. I don't even know who to pick. The Red Sox are the third best team to me. Um, so it's not saying a lot for the rest of the division. Uh, four. I'm gonna go Royals. Uh, they've okay. been hot lately. I think they're going to trade for a starting pitcher and really make a run at this with everyone on their team in the last year of their deals. Um, so I'm going to go Royals four just because they have the pedigree. They have that it factor. What the Red Sox don't have, the Royals have it. I I definitely see where you're coming from there. They didn't crack my top four, but I actually don't hate that you put them in the top four. We have the same top three. I went Astros, Indians, Red Sox. Couldn't agree more with everything you said there. I, I mean, it's – that's my top three. You can argue Red Sox too, but I think they're three for all the reasons that we just went over. Uh, my number four team, the Tampa Bay Rays, they're legit. Um, way better than expected. I don't think producer Graz is going to want to hear that because uh, the Yankees and the Rays are at a dogfight right now in that wild card race and in the division race. Um, but I, I just really like the Tampa Bay Rays. I think they're. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that they're much better than I anticipated. But they're they're a fun team to watch. Everything other than the fact that they're if they play in Tropicana Field uh, looks great this season. So um, that's my number four team. Uh, we will move on to the National League here. Uh, our number one teams should be the same here, but the rest I'm pretty interested because it's a stacked league. You want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, you go uh, first. I'll go Dodgers one. Uh, yeah. Their lineup's wicked deep. Um, their pitching staff's good. Jansen at the end of the game is like lights out. Um, I'm going to go Nationals too. Obviously, they've been like great, a great regular season team, just haven't had that it factor in the playoffs. You know, Scherzer hasn't been that guy in the playoffs. Strasburg hasn't stepped up. But I'm going to go too just because I think their lineup, you know, Rendon coming of age is a big help to them. Murphy's had a great season. Harper having one of his better seasons. So I think I'll go two with them. Three, I got to go with our Rockies. Uh, they've been hot lately. Still a lot of concerns about their pitching staff, but right. let's win 11-9 games at Coors Field and call it a day. Uh, I think that's the way they want to win. And then four, I'm going to go D-backs. Uh, they've been playing well. Um, good lineup. They obviously traded for J.D. Martinez, so that's a big that's a big move. Um, and Granke, I think, is that head of the rotation guy. Still worry about their bullpen, but, you know, they're top four in the NL for sure. 
So we got the same first two, Dodgers Nationals. I think that's probably the consensus there. Um, with the being the top four in the NL. Three, uh, our threes and fours are switched. I actually have the Diamondbacks third. I think that JD Martinez trade, which we'll get to in a few, um, I think that's gonna make a huge difference. Their lineup was already stacked. And now that you're adding JD Martinez to the mix, I mean that's an awesome addition for the Dimebacks, and they really didn't give up much either. Uh, Rockies and putting them fourth because I have concerns about that rotation. Um, whether those rookies can kind of outlast the, you know, the grind of August and September, head in Oct- into October, um, the way that they've kind of performed up to this point remains to be seen. I have question marks there. I have a lot less question marks with the Diamondbacks. Although, like you said, the Rockies bullpen is far superior to the Diamondbacks bullpen. So we'll see how that all plays out. But right now, it's it's a close three and four, but I got the Diamondbacks third, Rockies fourth. Uh, two teams we left out of both of our NL power rankings, the Cubs and the Pirates. Um, they're I think they're kind of inching closer to that top four. I don't know if they're in it. I don't think they're in it yet, obviously. But we're seeing the Pirates. They're 9-1 and one in their last 10 games. Um, they're showing they still have some fight in them because the bench is cleared. Again, for the second time this year, the Rockies and Pirates bench is cleared. Um, so that was interesting. What do you, what's your take on the Pirates right now? Yeah, they've been playing unreal, and it's really getting no publicity. Um, I just don't think people think they're contenders. Obviously, they got Starlin Marte back, which is big. Sort of three, along- three, three games back in the Central. Yeah, it's it crazy. elongates their lineup. Um, you know, they ha- they have the they have Garrett Cole. Like, if you have an ace, you can make a run. Um, the Cubs. I'm still out on the Cubs. I just, I just think they've been playing bad teams. I, I don't know if that's proven by their schedule, but they're losing today. They're about to lose to the White Sox today, three to one. For, yeah. like, I, you Dallas, just saw me check the score there. Uh, Miguel Gonzalez sure. is just like shutting them out today. So like yeah. that happens in the play. You can't, you can't let Miguel Gonzalez shut you out in the playoffs. Uh, I mean, in a regular game, if you want to win in the playoffs. So I'm, not, I'm out on the Cubs, but the Pirates have been hot. So that's a team to keep your eye on for sure. Well, NL Central is kind of a shit show right now. I'm kind of giving you this, like, gun to head right here, but what's your top three at the end for the uh, NL Central? How do you see those standings playing out? I, I, I'm on the Brewers bandwagon, so I'll yeah. keep them one. They've struggled. That's why I'm asking you, because they've struggled. They've given up that first-place spot to the Cubs uh, this past week, which, I mean, we should have seen coming. I didn't see it coming, but we sh- probably should have because it's the Milwaukee Brewers. Yeah, I mean, once they have to win their head to heads with the Cubs coming up. Uh, I'll go, I'll go Brewers one, uh, Cubs two, and then Pirates three. I, I, I just don't think the Pirates have the overall team, but it's a great story right now to keep your eye on. A team that came from like the depths and they're just like driving forward, making things interesting for sure. It's too bad your Reds, who you said were a sleeper in the NL Central, it's too bad they 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 cooled off a little bit. That's a freezing, um, freezing cold take now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's awesome. And we might have to post that on the EFIS again. Still got that clip ready to go. So, um, but yeah, do you, do you see the Pirates making a run for a, for a wild card spot competing with maybe like the Rockies or the Diamondbacks? Or do you think it's pretty set in stone who's taking the wild card there? That's what's, that's what's tough with the NL. It's like D-backs and Rockies would win any other division pretty much. Um, but yeah. the fact that they're in with the Dodgers, it, it the second wild card really isn't, you know, realistic for a lot of these teams to get. So I think the NL central games are going to be even more interesting. Like when the pirates play, play the brewers, Cubs play the brewers, pirates play the Cubs. It's going to be like bloodshed because that's like straight up games picking up on your contenders. So those games will be great coming down the stretch. Definitely. I mean, it's the year of the NL West. If people haven't realized that yet, then uh, welcome to the party. Uh, So we're going to move on here to grade that trade. Um, We're going to start here with a trade that we just mentioned, J.D. Mart- Martinez to the Diamondbacks. So we're sticking in the NL West here for a second. Uh, he was traded to the Diamondbacks, bolsters that lineup, Diamondbacks. Um, they didn't really give up much to the Tigers in this trade. They gave up a couple middle-of-the-road prospects. Uh, who knows if one day they'll magically blossom into really good talent. But until then, looks like a steal for the Diamondbacks here. I'm going to give them an A, straight A. Yeah. I'm going to give it a day. I think J.D. Martinez is wicked underrated. He plays in Detroit. No one really watches their games. Uh, he's got power to all fields. He's going to hit a lot of home runs in that Diamondbacks park. Uh, yeah. I, I give it a day, too. For the Tigers, I give it a D. I, I, don't, I think you should have asked for better prospects. I know the Diamondbacks. I'm pretty sure they have the worst farm system in baseball. 
Um, but if that's the case, you just don't trade them to the Diamondbacks. Like, I don't know. Like, I, don't, I really don't know the solution there I get for the Tigers, but I, I think a better deal could have been made if they waited a little bit longer and sort of dangled him at this deadline. Uh, so I don't think – I give the Tigers a D. I'm not ready to give them an F for it because who knows what those prospects are made of, but I'll give them a D. Yeah. As, you, as I said last podcast, I'm not a prospect guy, so right. I'd, give them, I'd give them a D. Anytime you lose J.D. Martinez, I mean, that's a huge loss. You could get a lot more from him, uh, a lot more for him. I would have loved him seem to go to the Red Sox. We need a bat like that in the middle of the order. Uh, that would have been amazing. Out of the playoffs. That would have been great. Throw him at DH, see what he's capable of, which exactly. we know is hitting bombs. Um, yeah. So next trade here is another blockbuster. Uh, Todd Frazier. I don't know how to say this guy's name. Tommy Cano Con- Conley. Uh, Producer Graz, I need you here. Yankee fan, I need you to pronounce this guy's name. Canely. Canely. Tommy Canely. Thank you. That's, I mean, that's, what, that's, what he, that's what you're there for. Yeah, uh, also, and then we got David Robertson. It's the, yeah. it's the Tommy Canely deal. I'll explain later. You guys are talking about it, but it okay. is all about Tommy okay. Canely. I really like that take. So, Frazier, Canely, Robertson, all to the Yankees. Yankees gave up some top prospects in this deal. Um, like I said, when Dr. Tom came on, Dr. Tom was a big fan of this trade. It sounded like I like it for both sides. The White Sox, it's clear what they're trying to do. They're trying to rebuild, get a lot of young talent, and they're doing it. Uh, the Yankees clearly still set on on um, competing this season, uh, which they should be. I mean, they're probably going to be in the wild card game. They're probably going to make, at this rate, they're probably going to make a run for the top of the division right along with the Red Sox. Uh, we'll see what the Rays think of that. But right now it looks like it's a three, three-headed three monster in that AL East between the Red Sox, Rays, Yankees. So the Yankees are very much in this. But Todd Frazier, a guy who the Red Sox originally were supposed to get, and the Yankees came in and swooped in last second and got him. So uh, I'm going to give this – I'm going to give it a B for the Yankees. Now, they got two really nice bullpen arms in Canley and Robertson. I don't like the rental of Frazier. I don't think you're getting much there. I think you could get – I know Chase Jace Headley's nothing to write home about, I just don't think Frazier's that much of an upgrade. Now, Caitlin Robertson, I'm with producer Graz on this one. They're the reasons why this trade is a B or a B plus because I think those two are bullpen arms that the Yankees needed when Chapman and Batantis aren't really who the Yankees anticipated them to be. So I'm going to give the Yankees like a borderline B, B plus. I'm going to give the White Sox an A minus because they're doing – they're continuing – to build this team, get young talent, and see what it can do. So that those are my grades. Zach, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, this is like a hockey trade. I think this both teams got value here. I'm going to give both teams an A-. I think the White Sox got their prospects that they're just trying to stockpile right now. And the Yankees got bullpen help. Robertson, obviously, who was with them before, and Canely, who's, like Graz is saying, he's like the, the star of that deal with his K- – I mean, he strikes out everyone when he comes into the game. Uh, Frazier, kind of a throw-in. You know, he's kind of an afterthought in this deal. Like you said, Justin, right. not, not the guy that anyone's really looking to have huge production out of. So I think it was a good move for each team. I don't think the Yankees are a contender, so I'm not sure if it's like a bad deal in that sense, but I'll give both teams an A-. minus. Graz, what do you think? Okay, it's very simple. <laughs> if you look at it as you're getting your two these two pitching pitchers just un- understandably better – because you can either go one way or the other. You can look at starting pitching, which is kind of weak ever since Quintana got traded, and try to trade for some starting pitching, which they really need help in. Or you can strengthen your bullpen and do the Royals, how they won the World Series, and say, oh, we're just going to pitch five innings and then blow you away with our bullpen. Okay. And that's what the decision that Brian Cash made is these, this is a way for us to strengthen our bullpen and say, we don't need starting pitching. We need CC to go out there for five innings, and then we'll blow you away with four different people that can throw upwards of 97 miles an hour. And that's yeah. why I like it the best. It, and the reason I like it the most, even more so than that, is it's getting back to the, oh, the Red Sox want those people? Oh, F the Red Sox. Fuck them. We're way better than them. We're going to go get them. We don't even need these people, but we're going to go get them just because screw that other team. And I was talking to my Red Sox friends from school, and they said the same thing, how like it makes it more exciting when they're both competing for the same players. Because then we can get back to the, you know, today is the anniversary of the Jason Veritek A-Rod fight. So, like, that kind of stuff. That I missed what are your thoughts on the childhood. guys that the uh, that the Yankees gave up? Blake Rutherford, Ian Clark, and uh, oh. two of their better prospects. And mainly, mainly Rutherford, but 
Um, I know yeah. a lot of Yankee fans were upset that he went, but I think it, it's getting to a point where, you know, prospects aren't the answer. So You have to give up something to get something, and you gave up maybe, I don't know, probably a top five at least, top three maybe prospect because he was their first-round pick last year. But the thing is with that, yeah, he's an outfielder. Where are you going to put him? Because you have Clint Frazier that's raking and hits doubles all over. Aaron Judge who's going to win the next seven MVPs. Straight, not even a question. And then you're not <laughs> even forgetting about the fact that you know, what <laughs> eight straight. And then you're not even talking about the fact that Hot there's taste. no doubt in my heart, no doubt in my heart that Bryce Harper is going to be a Yankee. So I don't know where you're going to put this guy. So they absolutely needed to trade him yeah, and try to get some prospect. I know the Bryce Harper thing's more ridiculous, but you still have Aaron Hicks coming back too, who's been actually playing really well. But the thing with this trade that gets me is that I convinced myself that uh, Chris Carter was a viable option at first base, <laughs> and now you're telling me that Chase Headley and Todd Frazier are doing it. Honestly, it's better. Way more positive. Okay. And so Todd I'm going like to go out on a limb here, Graz, and say that your grade is an A-plus on the Yankees' side. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Nah, it's an A. Okay. It's not an A-plus. An A-plus a would be if they somehow traded the Red Sox for sale. I don't know why they didn't do that in the beginning of the year either. Yeah, it's crazy. But – um. All right, so what about yeah. – the- And then the, the White Sox okay. are good too. Yeah, the White Sox are great. I want to know. Because the, the guy's raking, and they're doing all the right things. They also get an A because okay. they're doing the, all the – they're saying, oh, you know, we got we got a Brayu as the only valuable guy, and he's only like 25, 26 years old. So by the time he's rounding into his slugging form, which, you know, sluggers are usually around 30, 31 where they're still hitting the ball out of the park, we'll have all these guys to build around. They're doing the right, right. thing. Definitely an A for them too. Graz, I'm it's give a you hockey an a trade. Yeah, you nailed it right on the head. I'm going to give you an A for those takes because you threw Harper in there. You threw a lot of shit in there I didn't anticipate. And you know what? I don't hate it. And, You're going to get ready for it. And I'll say this. The fact that Frazier didn't go to the Red Sox was should have made me happy because I didn't want Frazier on the Red Sox really at all. It, the fact that he went to the Yankees actually made me be like, fuck the Yankees. We should have got Frazier. Like, I was a little upset. So, I like, I agree with what you said about that little rivalry of, like, the Yankees swooping in, taking him from the Red Sox. And um, I, anything that might reheat this rivalry, I'm all in I'm all in for it. So One thing I'll say is a bullpen doesn't mean anything if you're down 5-1. Like, <laughs> after CC Sabathia gives up, like, bombs. <laughs> That's also a fact. <laughs> um, all right, so the last trade here, Zach, I feel like we agree a lot on this podcast, sometimes to a fault. Like, we don't really have debates – or anything like it's it's tough sometimes because we agree on a lot of shit i have to shit on you here who gives a fuck that sergio romo went to the Rays? the guy had like a six five you you wrote it on the topic list he had like a 6.5 era uh the guy is the definition of a dud he used to be good with the giants unreal slider now that thing hangs in there in every single hitter's wheelhouse the guy doesn't know how to get people out anymore he's going to the Rays. he's probably not even gonna get much playing time Zach, thoughts? I am going to say this right now. Sergio <laughs> Romo will be my don't call it a comeback in two weeks. When he becomes a shut down World Series form guy that we know he is. He's got rings. Who on the Rays has rings? Dude, the I, guy, think, I think he wants some pedigree. The guy refused to sign with East Coast teams when he signed with the Dodgers. He only wanted to stay in the West Coast. And now he's getting traded to the – to Tampa Bay, the grossest stadium in the league. The guy can't get people out. He he is going to be my dud of the week in two weeks. So we'll see how this goes. We'll be keeping an eye on Sergio Romo. I don't even have a grade. I have, you know what I'm going to give this trade? I'm going to give it an incomplete. Remember getting incompletes? I didn't uh, get many of those, but yeah. I didn't either. I just saw them on the report card. You like There was a list of all the possible grades you can get, and incomplete was one of them. I'm giving this trade incomplete because who fucking cares? Yeah. One last <laughs> one last trade that just went official. The Twins got Jaime Garcia and Anthony Recker for the Twins' 22nd best prospect. So that's an that's an A for the Twins. You get a lefty yeah. starter for your 22nd prospect. I mean, you yeah. take that every day of the week. Oh, yeah. I was waiting for that trade to go official. That was originally on a topic list. I wrote an article on it, and then it turns out it wasn't official. That's on me. Uh, Garcia struggling this year, but a capable arm guy who the twins are right in the mix. I mean, they, they could get a wild card berth. They might even sneak up in that central. Now 
I really don't know. It's it's the AL such a shit show where it's kind of unpredictable. But Garcia is the kind of guy who can help this team win those extra games and maybe p- make a playoff push. So I give this trade an A for the Twins. Same. And the Braves, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like I get like. Garcia is probably your best option in that rotation. I know R.A. Dickey's doing okay, whatever. You got a couple other guys in there, but you're the Braves. You're trying to rebuild, and you're just getting the 22nd best prospect. You could do a little better. I want to give them an F. Like, what are you doing? Especially what Graz was saying. It's a weak starting pitching, like, class, free agent class. Like, Quintana was probably the best. So, I mean, Garcia's got to be second best at that point. They only get right. 22nd twins, 22nd prospect. That's, that's bad, uh, you know, payback there. You got to think that the Braves aren't done uh, at this deadline. They have some work to do, so we'll see. We'll see what other moves they make. But I'm giving them an F for this trade. I don't. I don't really get it. Um, maybe people disagree with me. Think that I don't know who this 22nd prospect is. Maybe he's actually really good and like having a great season. Who knows? But yeah, I like this trade for the Twins. I don't like it for the Braves. Um, all right. So that was grade that trade, uh, Sergio Romo. All all eyes are on you, bro. Uh, so we'll move on to Dud of the Week as always. Our first segment, my dud of the week, Zach, is a guy I never thought I would have on dud of the week. It's Ioannis Cespedes. What's going on with this guy? Wow. Uh, no home runs in the past week. There's a power outage for sure for Cespedes this season. He's batting 222 in the last week with a 481 OPS. I don't know if he even knows where he is uh, when he's at the plate. So Cespedes is my dud of the week. I think he dyed his hair like purple or blue or something too. So that's a dud move. Uh, yeah, that's the definition of a dud move. So that that's fitting. Uh, my dud, this guy gets so much applause. Like people love this guy. I don't understand it. Like I don't think he's that good at all. Lance McCullers Jr. from the Astros. Okay, yeah. I yep. mean, he's only 23, so he's young. But this people have anointed him like this, the next like go-to pitcher, like shutdown pitcher. He's gotten shelled in his last three starts since the All-Star break. Four, 14 innings pitched in three starts. So he's going like four innings. He's given up 15 earned runs, seven walks. If the Astros want to make a run, and he's going to be their quote-unquote second starter behind Keuchel. He better pick up his game. Uh, he has not been good since the All-Star break. Uh, this is a hot take, but the Astros scare me for a lot of reasons. Um, I think the Korea injury is like a bad omen almost. Like, uh-oh, here comes the downfall. Like, things have been too good to be true for the Astros this season, it seems. And now you got McCullers struggling. I've never been a huge fan of him either. I agree with you. I don't know why he's so hyped up. I see him all over my Twitter timeline anytime he does anything. And I I just don't think they have all the pieces to win a World Series. Maybe I'm probably going to eat my words come October. But it's just – they're one of those teams. It's like, how are they so good? Uh, and McCullers, we're seeing that he's not quite the pitcher that we all – well, not I shouldn't say all because me and you were on the same page with him, but a lot of people thought he is because he's struggling hard, like as you just mentioned. Um, so that's dud of the week. We'll move on to don't call it a comeback. So basically the opposite of a dud. Um, you go first for this one. So I mentioned him earlier in the podcast. Uh, I'm all in on the Cleveland Indians, and, and this guy just came back from Cleveland. He was out a month and a half with elbow. Uh, I think it was shoulder soreness. Um, Danny Salazar. He had a five and a half ERA before, uh, before he went on the DL, and he came back, um, pitched versus the Blue Jays, who have a decent offense, went seven innings, one hit, eight Ks. Uh, he only got to 86 pitches. It's an unreal start. If he can be any, anywhere where he was last year, uh, sort of as a shutdown guy, the Indians are going to have one hell of a starting rotation to beat in the playoffs. It really could go one of two ways with Salazar. Salazar now has – you could say he's injury prone. This past year has not been kind to Salazar when it comes to injuries. But if he's on, the Indians will be on. If he's not around, I don't know if they're like the number two team, like I said they are in the AL. There's question marks because Salazar is that much of a difference maker in that rotation. He's so underrated. Um, guys like Kluber are going to get all the attention, but then you got Salazar in there. Um, that's a really nice option to have when healthy. So that's a great don't call it comeback. My don't call to come back is one that is going to make you happy. It's Trevor Story. Um, great week for Trevor Story. If he can get back on the right track here, he's kind of struggled this season. Um, but if he can get back on this track, then 
the Rockies especially will be in good shape. He's hitting 333 in the last week with two homers, nine RBI. Um, so it's good to see that the all-star break, like he sort of rejuvenated himself afterwards. We'll see if he can keep it up. But when he's hot, the Rockies are hot. We're seeing that. Um, and when he's hot and Arenado's hot, you know, that, that becomes a very scary, scary, scary team. Yeah. That's, that's a hot team. If Trevor's story starts hitting and Ian Desmond starts turning around, that's yeah. a scary lineup. Absolutely. Speaking of hot, we'll move on to our last segment here. It's called when you're hot, you're hot. I'm going to go first for this one. And my guy is a guy I'm sure many people have not heard of. It's Chris Taylor on the LA Dodgers. Um, I never even heard. I'll, I'll admit that I haven't even heard of him until now um, or until this past week. He's gone 13 for 24 with two homers, three doubles, and a triple for the Dodgers. Just coming out of nowhere as if the Dodgers needed another piece. Uh, like we saw Bellinger come out of nowhere in late April, and now we got this Chris Taylor guy coming from the cloud. So he's my when you're hot, you're hot because – He's the definition of what when you're hot, you're hot is supposed to be. It's just some guy who comes out of nowhere and just starts killing it. Yeah, I was almost going to pick him. He's been unreal for the Dodgers. They just have these guys come up like Bellinger and Taylor like quietly, and then they just go on a tear. Exactly. And no one notices. Um, yeah, my friend texted me. He went to UVA, and he's like, keep your eye on this Taylor guy. Like right when he came up, he's like, this really? guy was unreal in college. So in- Inside source for the ethos. Yeah. <laughs> I heard it before you. My when you're high, you're hot. I think this guy might be the most underrated player in baseball. Um, if, he, if his career trajectory stays on where it's going right now, I think he could be a Hall of Famer. And that's, like, kind of insane. It's Jonathan Scope from the Orioles. You're a big Scope guy. I'm a, you said he had the best – I think you said he had one of the best swings in baseball on a past podcast. I'm pretty sure you said that. Yeah. Like, if you, he's top three in every category for second baseman you know, right behind Altuve and Altuve is like so coveted. Like everyone thinks he's like the, the best player, one of the best players in baseball scope is just has, you know, just as many RBIs, more power this past week. He's hit three home runs, uh, 16 RBIs in a week. Yep. I mean, I think Jonathan scope, like the Orioles have obviously, you know, trended downward this year, but I, I love watching him play. I mean, he's smooth at second. He's got a great swing. You're definitely right. He's underrated because I never hear anything about him. And I'm not really like a huge Jonathan Scope guy. And I'm usually one of those guys who's like, oh, check out this under the radar player. Check out this under the radar player. But the numbers don't lie. He he was the AL player of the week. Um, he you, you just mentioned exactly why he's killing it this season. So I don't really need to go further into that. But Jonathan Scope, excellent pick for when you're hot, you're hot. He's on fire right now on an Orioles team. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of the Orioles, but Jonathan Scope is picking up the slack in that lineup when Manny Machado is struggling, Chris Davis is struggling. So um, props to Scope for sure. And Chris Taylor, um, both having unreal weeks. We'll see if they keep it up. Um, on that note, be sure to subscribe on iTunes. Leave a nice little review. If you leave a funny five-star review, we'll, le- we'll read it on the on the podcast. Um, follow us on Twitter at Ephus Pod, where you'll find all of our episodes, uh, little funny clips from the show. You'll find all sorts of high- baseball highlights on there. Um, so do that, and like us on Facebook. Do a little, do a little search, search uh, Ephus Pod on Facebook, and see what you find, and give it a little like. Uh, on that note, Zach, I think that's it. Producer Graz, thank you for coming in, your first ever appearance on the show. Uh, any final thoughts from you? All I want to say is to keep people interested, find out later on Twitter what my favorite story of the week, and it features Ronald Torres, my favorite Yankee. <laughs> That's a tease. So follow I at – wait for that. <laughs> follow That's a good one. At Ephus Oh, pod. you guys will know after the pod. Everyone else has to tune in. I'll tell you guys. I love it. I love it. All right. That's a nice little tease there. We will see you guys later. Peace.